Good day, everybody, and welcome to Insects of the Night. This is one of SSU's Dig Into Nature Fall 2022 educational series for students and other members of the community. We are fortunate today to have many SSU students joining us from the Biology Colloquium. I'm glad you're all, you're all here today. My name is Margot Rollins, and I'm the program coordinator with SSU's Center for Environmental Inquiry, and we are the producers of these programs. I'll be your host today, so let me know if there's anything you'd like. I have put you all on mute, but you can unmute yourself if there's something you need attention with. To begin with, we want to acknowledge, honor, and make visible that Sonoma State University is located and its preserves on the ancestral lands of the native people. Personally, I am coming to you from the homeland of central Pomo in southern Mendocino County. Can everyone please take a minute to type your full name into the chat because that's gonna be our way of seeing uh, who was with us today because some of the sometimes people's email I mean, their, their Zoom names aren't, aren't their full names. So thank you, appreciate that. And our presenter today is Kevin Monroe, who was the director of the Nature Conservancy Preserves on Long Island, New York. Before heading east, Kevin was the executive director of Laguna de Santa Rosa in Sonoma County, and he did special projects for the Center for Environmental Education at SSU. He brings extensive knowledge of all things in nature, but particularly insects as an entomologist, one of his loves. Before we begin, I wanna tell you just a little bit about the center. We are here to empower students of all ages and disciplines to solve the environmental challenges of the North Bay. And our motto as it were, is to turn education into action. We provide direct outdoor experiences through these educational programs, and we have classes and skill building sessions on all three of our preserves. Sonoma Mountains Osborne Preserve. In Kenwood, we have the Los Guilapos, and up here in Mendocino County, the Galbraith Preserve. We invest in real world projects, working with PG&E, working with Sonoma Water and other companies to focus on finding solutions to these environmental issues. And finally, we have long-term multi-organizational partnerships still get the issue that surround things like fire and water technology and topics. We want you to leave today with a better understanding of our connection with the environment and with new or honed skills that Kevin will share with you that'll help you contribute to these sustainable solutions. Kevin asks that you put your questions into the chat as we go along and he will we'll stop a couple of times and I will go through them and field them for him. Because the uh, colloquium ends at 1250, we're gonna prioritize questions from the students. So if you are a student and with a question, please preface it by putting student so that we can be sure to address all of yours before you have to leave. We will do more, more Q&A after that for those of you who don't get into the first round as it were. And Kevin has graciously agreed to stay on later if there's still more things that we are, um, haven't covered yet. And please feel free to get in touch with me. My email will be in the chat and uh, you should have it also on, uh, on all the communications that have come from, from the university about this. And with that, Kevin, let's take it away. Excellent, thank you, Margot. Um, I'm gonna chat just a second here, a little screen and then I'll, I'll pull up my PowerPoint presentation. Great to see everyone. It's such a big group, which is wonderful. I'm glad there's this many people interested in, in insects. Um, throughout my career, I've sort of done a combination of environmental education and outreach, ecological restoration, and resource management. And a nice thing about insects, they kind of remind me of birds in that they can be used as a stepping stone or an ambassador or a window into all of those three areas I just talked about really any ecological or biological idea or principle can be taught through insects. They're just a great way to get people into nature. And I think we'll sort of learn that as we go. And as Margot said, if you have questions, put them in the chat. 
Mm -hmm. um, with this many people, there may your we may not get to your question until the very end. But we will. I'll stay on long enough to get to everybody's question for sure. Okay, go ahead and pull up presentation here. Okay, I may toggle back and forth a little bit sometimes. I'll try not to make people dizzy, but we had some issues with advancing before. So, so anyhow, so as I mentioned, insects are just a great way to bring people into nature. Um, so I always love to kind of use them as ambassadors, as I mentioned. We are going to be talking about specifically insects of the night today. And I wanted to kind of start by setting the stage with why California itself is, is so special. And I think you can just um, sort of see what I've written here. California does have the highest level of biodiversity in the country, also the highest level of endemism, which means species that aren't found anywhere else. And that's, because, that's a product of the state's variability of landforms, climate, and soil types. Another way to say that is California biodiversity is built on habitat breadth and depth more than any other state and the resulting native plant diversity. So it means lots of insects. So you're in a good state to be um, trying to learn about insects. So why do insects come out at night? Well, there's fewer predators, uh, especially diurnal predators like birds. So it's easier for them to hide and stay alive and not get eaten. And there's more food for them because there's so many insects out at night, including other invertebrates. Um, and I have a list there, midges, caterpillars, springtails, mites, snails, worms. So they're less likely to get eaten and there's more for them to eat. What are some other reasons they're out at night? What's well, cooler? Drag or insects don't like it when it's really cold, right? They disappear in the winter um, or they go underground at least, but they do like it slightly cooler. And so the night gives them that, and it's more humid. Humidity is huge for dragonflies. I'm sorry, for insects. That's why there's so many insects in tropical rainforests. Also, insects' senses are perfect for the night. They're very sensitive to vibrations. They have excellent chemical sensing, both through taste and smell, and good hearing. So nighttime's just perfect for them. And you can see some of these super antenna that they have. Um, and just a little fun fact there, giant silk moths, the male can pick up female pheromones from 30 miles away. And I've double checked that several times, that is correct, 30 miles. So that's really pretty incredible. Now, what insects will you see when you're out at night? Almost all insects are out, at least in, in some numbers at night, except for butterflies, bees, dragonflies, and damselflies. We're going to focus on the insects that are out the most at night, and that's beetles, moths, lacewings, ichneumon wasps, aquatic flyers, which are simply insects whose larva stage is underwater, caddisfly, stonefly, mayfly, etc., and crickets and katydids. So we're going to focus on the insects that are easiest to see at night because there's so many of them out. Now, what insects will you actually hear in addition to seeing? And I'm just going to read this here. Orthopterans, which are crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers, are the primary nocturnal insect musicians. And sometimes you might hear the occasional gnawing beetle grub in a nearby tree or a buzzing beetle flying in for a landing. Cicadas, which you probably all heard about, totally unrelated. Related to aphids, they're diurnal. You might hear them at early dusk, but by nighttime, they're silent. So really it's crickets, katydids, and grasshoppers that are singing at night. Tree crickets, field crickets, and katydids especially, we're gonna focus on those three groups. Tree crickets, field crickets, and katydids. There are also conehead grasshoppers, but really just in the Central Valley. So I'm gonna focus on these, um, the tree crickets, field crickets, and katydids, because they're more in, in Northern California. So just look at the pictures up here and go ahead and, and put in the chat. What differences do you see between the tree crickets and the field crickets? Just go ahead and enter. We'll go ahead and throw an idea in, in the chat just to sort of get your, your brain moving here. And also what differences do you see, let's say between the field cricket and the katydids? You know, these sort of subtle 
sometimes bigger differences are field marks that you can use in the field to tell them apart. So one thing is that the tree cricket and the field cricket are sort of um, flattened horizontally, if that makes sense, yeah. sort of from the top. And the katydids are more flattened laterally from the sides. And that's because the katydids are really trying to look like leaves. They're higher up. The katydids are higher up in the trees. So they're more trying to look like leaves where the field crickets and tree crickets are a little lower down, either on the ground or in shrubs, pressed up against the bark. So they have sort of a different body shape. They hear songs from each other from ears on their legs, believe it or not. And their sound is made by rubbing their top wings together. They all have four wings. They're rubbing their top wings together to make their beautiful sounds. So we're actually gonna listen to some of these sounds. Now, 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 most of the time, what you're hearing are the males making sounds to either attract the females or to let the other males know, hey, stay away. Kind of like birds. They're saying, this is my territory and they're trying to attract the ladies. They're trying to do both of those things. So I'm not gonna play all of these, but I'm gonna play a couple of them. Let's see, let's, um, let's play the Western rock loving field cricket. Hey, Manny. Now that is probably what you think of when you think of a field cricket, that sort of chirp, 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 chirp. Here's a faster kind of, this is called the mud crack field cricket. See, that's quite different. Now keep those in mind. I'm gonna play the snowy tree cricket and we're gonna play the snowy tree cricket when it's cold at night, when it's warm at night, and when it's hot at night. And see if you can um, hear the difference between them. So this is a snowy tree cricket when it's cold at night. Here's the same species, could literally be- We couldn't hear it, Kevin. Okay. We're, um, have you been getting feedback that people haven't been able to hear any of it? No, I haven't, but I have, I could hear the, uh, the last one you did, but I didn't hear the one before that. I thought maybe it's because I was admitting people and I wasn't focused, but this, are other people having the same problem? Please put in the chat if you are. Yep. Okay. Okay. I'm going to try the cold one again. Thank this, you is, all. this is the cold snowy tree cricket. Not getting it. Try the warm okay. one. Okay. <laughs> and I'll do what I did last time I did this program too. I will send everybody just the recording, the slide with the recordings. So you'll be able to listen to all of these yourself. We'll send you a, a PDF that just has the recordings if you weren't able to hear it today. So no, no worries. Nope, I'm not getting it. Okay. Was was anybody able to hear the snowy tree cricket? If you were able to hear it, would you put it in the chat? I'm getting nopes. <laughs> no, okay. I think not. Okay. Well, we will um, you know, we will send these out to everybody. So you'll yeah, be I'll able get it out right away after as soon as we finish. Awesome. So just just to give you a sense when the tree cricket, when it's cold, it's very slow. The call is very slow, the chirping. And then when it's warm, it speeds up a little bit. And then when it's hot, it's going really quite fast. Um, and that's true of all these crickets. You can hear um, some of these katydids, especially singing November, and they're like, chirp, chirp. <laughs> you know, there's several seconds in between. And then if it's an August or July night, chirp, 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 chirp. It's so fast, you almost can't hear the separate chirps. So insects are cold-blooded, it's in a different way than reptiles and amphibians, but for all intents and purposes, they're cold-blooded. So the speed of their call um, has a lot to do with the temperature that night. 
Okay, so I will try one of these. Uh, we won't do all of them if you're not able to hear. Let's see if people are able to hear the chaparral Katie did. So again, we've looked at the field cricket and the tree crickets. Now we're looking at the Katie dids. These are all species in Northern California. Yeah, like by Chloe, I heard a little something at the beginning. Okay, okay. Yeah, there. I guess my um, my computer is not um, excited about um, sharing the uh, sharing the sounds of people. So we will be sure to send that to you. Okay. So each of these have a very, very different call. And when you are out at night, you know, you can tell what's living in the forest by listening to these. The websites that I will send you, you can get on your, your iPhone. So you can be out there identifying the calls in the forest by listening on your iPhone. You can record them while you're out there and then have them identified for you on these various websites. So it's an exciting way to sort of figure out who's living in the forests around your house. And depending on where you live, Northern California, you're gonna have a slightly different group of katydids or crickets, um, field crickets, tree crickets. I'll also be sending Margot and then she'll send to all of you a list of all the orthopterans that sing in California. And each one of them has a map county by county. So you can look at the katydids, tree crickets, and field crickets that are singing in your county. Um, and it just allows you to have this whole new experience when you're going, going out there at night. Some of them are very loud and very fast and they're very quiet. It's interesting how they sort of divide up the um, auditory landscape of the night by having songs that sort of hit at different frequencies. Someone asks, can you show us where the where their ears are on their legs? Um, I believe it is, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it is somewhere on their hind legs. I believe it is somewhere on their hind legs. That's a good question. I, I'll, I'll try to figure that out and I will send that information to all of you. Uh, but I believe it's on their, their hind legs. And then here's just a picture. You see the upper right-hand corner, you see the tree cricket with its wings up in the upper right-hand corner. That shows how the tree crickets use their top wings and rub them together and make the sound. And all these orthopterans use their top wings similar to that. Some of them don't hold them as high as that tree cricket, but they are using their top wings to sing their songs. And then I believe it's their hind legs that has the ears. I'll find that out for you. Does anybody, you know what? I'm actually, I'm gonna pass this because I know we had some technical difficulties. I wanna slow us down too much. So we will stop um, again soon for some questions. So just be sure to put them in the chat so you don't lose any questions you have. Don't forget them, put them in the chat and Margo and I will go over them and, and be sure they get answered. And just feel free to kind of do that as we go. So we talked about insects you're gonna hear. Let's talk a little bit about what insects you're gonna see these crickets, katydids, they're often really well hidden. Well, what are some insects out there that are quiet, but you could still see them? Well, beetles is a big group. Don't worry about memorizing this. There are more beetles than all their insects together, right? So I'm gonna go over a couple groups, just allow the diversity of these beetles to kind of wash over you. Just enjoy it. Enjoy all these beautiful beetles. This is recorded. You'll be able to go back and look at it. It takes a lifetime to learn all the beetles. Um, so just enjoy some of these pictures. Maybe you'll remember a couple of the names and you can certainly go back and, and look at them and I'll share resources for everybody to learn your beetles. 
So there's glow worms, which is really a type of firefly. Um, you can see the one of them, the Douglas fir glow worm, has this amazing antenna for picking up the pheromones of the females. There is the longhorned beetles. That's the second group there, very well named. Their antenna is what they're calling horns. So longhorned antenna have long or long horned beetles um, rather have long antenna. That's where that name comes. That pine sawyer borer, that was photographed by one of the CEI staff. I think that might've been um, Suzanne. I think she sent that photo from her car windshield. And then you can see the, the, calif the large, the large California longhorn beetle on the lower right-hand side, huge body, huge antenna. So there's quite a few longhorn beetles that you can see out, especially if you have night lights, which we'll talk about later. So these are just two groups. Here's a couple more groups, the metallic wood boring beetles and the click beetles. Metallic wood boring beetles grubs live inside of trees. So often when there are trees that are dying or trees that are forests that are having major, is major issues, it's a wood borer beetle. They're usually exotics. The native wood boring beetles have evolved with our trees. So they usually don't damage very many of them. When there are many, many trees dying, it's usually because of invasive exotic wood boring beetles or because of huge changes from fire and climate change. And then even the na native beetle populations can have a detrimental effect because it's now so warm and there's so many fires that their population numbers are out of whack, even though they're natives. There's also the click beetles here. Their larvae are underneath the bark rather than in the tree. So they, they have less damage and they're called click beetles because if you put them on their back, they click and, and, and swivel over like a turtle. And that loud click is also supposed to scare birds off or predators. And you can see one of them has spots on its elytra, I'm sorry, on its thorax. That large segment behind the head is the thorax. And those big eye spots are to scare away birds or other predators just long enough for the beetle to drop into the leaves and run away. So you can see these, these critters at night. Two other beetle group, groups are the ground beetles and the darkling beetles. The ground beetles are fast because they're predators. They gotta catch stuff. The darkling beetles are slower because they're either eating plants or they're, they're scavenging, they're decomposing dead leaves. So they don't have to chase anything. <laughs> so they're slower, they're heavier, they're a little more rounded. Ground beetles are, are fast, a little more pointed. They have to run after things and catch them. The lower ground beetle has that very thin pointed head for Snick sticking his head inside of a snail and killing it and eating it. This ground beetle is called a snail leader. So they're very, um, very interesting. And you can see quite a few of those at night. Some other beetle groups are weevils. I believe there are more weevils than all their beetles combined. So there's lots and lots of weevils. They always have the snout. One way to tell them apart from the other beetles, the flat bark beetle is exceptionally flat, as you can see, and it's bright red, doesn't look like anything else. Engraving beetles are tiny. They're actually bigger than even that smallest picture next to the word tiny. They're maybe half that size. They can cause some damage to trees, but they're normally just under the bark rather than deep in the tree, so not as much damage. Um, really interesting, tough little beetles. Then you have the scarabs, which are round and clunky. They often bump clumsily into our screens at night. These are the June beetles or May beetles that you hear running into your windows. They're kind of like the bumblebees of the beetles, I think of them, because they're kind of um, large and a little clumsy and charming. <laughs> um, and they have these big branched antennas, as you can see from several of them. So that shape, their kind of clumsiness, their big antenna one way to tell them. And all the pictures I'm showing tonight are specifically insects you can see in California. Just wanted to mention that again. Moths, oh my goodness. For every butterfly, there's like 20 species of moths at least. So it literally takes scientists a lifetime to learn even all the moths in one area. So we're gonna look at a tiny, tiny, we'll look at like two slides of them tonight. And there's probably a thousand slides we could look at. So sphinx moths are a very common group that you can see at night lights. Kind of pointed head, pointed abdomen, 
pointed wings, they're fast flyers, they have tongues two or three times the length of their body. They're important pollinators. They use those long tongues to drink nectar from night blooming flowers. There are flowers that only bloom at night and they're pollinated by moths. Then you have the underwing moth, which is well-named. You can see why they're called that. They flash those bright underwing colors to scare away birds. They look like bark until they move those upper wings. Then all of a sudden it's orange and black. That split second that the bird predator is startled, just enough time for the moth to fly away or drop down into the leaves. All it needs is one second of startling a bird. Again, these are all things you can see right there in Northern California. Tiger moths, glassy wings. You can see they're using that same red color to scare things. Sheet moths, we had thousands of these at, at Osborne. Um, and then several of these big um, giant silk moths, that beautiful one up in the right-hand um, corner. They don't have functioning mouth parts. They live just long enough to breed and lay eggs. There are some moths that are very active, have long adult lives. They pollinate. Some of them feed on moss. Um, there are a couple moths that are actually predators, but that's very, very rare. And then there are quite a few moths that have no functioning mouth parts. Their majority of their life is as a caterpillar, like the giant silk moth, and they're alive for like a week as an adult to mate and lay eggs and then they die. Then there's endless more families, and these are just a couple of them. The plume moths, which look kind of bizarre, like they have these wide shoulders. I think they're probably either trying to look like a twig or maybe even imitate a wasp. Geometrids, those are the inchworms. Very showy, cute little caterpillars doing their inchworm movement. But then as an adult, they're very well camouflaged. The owlet moths, the deceptive sallow moths. Some of these names are great. Looks like lichen, doesn't it? That's camouflaged to look like lichen. The lapid moth in the lower right-hand corner anyone guess what that is trying to look like? Go ahead and throw your guess in the chat. What do you think the lappet moth is trying to imitate so it will not get eaten if an owl finds it in the middle of the night? What do you think that lappet moth is trying to imitate that'll make it unappetizing to a predator? Well, I'm, I'm not looking at, at, at the chat, although I'm sure Margo is, but I'm going to guess that, I'm going to hope that maybe some of you said bird dropping, because that's what it's trying to look like. It's trying to look like a, a bird dropping, and some lappet moths are called bird dropping moths, which I don't know how they would feel about that, <laughs> but um, that is what they're trying to look like, and so it makes them look unappetizing. There are some well, moths. People had good responses, I, I think. Well, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, Marco, yeah, go ahead and read them. A couple of people said that they thought it was trying to look like ash. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. And someone else said hair, that, which aren't either things that are very appealing, it seems. And I think both of those are probably correct. You know, there are many species of lappet moths. Some of them look exactly like bird droppings, and some of them are going to look like ash or bark or hair. So I think those answers are all correct. There's probably hundreds of species of lappet moths. Um, and I imagine they're trying to look like all those things you've mentioned. So really ingenious um, evolution happening here. Lots of moths have just ingenious camouflage techniques. So that was really good guesses, everybody. I think you're all right. So then here we're looking at ignumen mosps, wasps as long as one crane fry. Ignumen in Latin, I believe, means no stinging or doesn't sting. Ovipositors are what wasps use to lay eggs. Modified ovipositors can inject venom as well as eggs. So when you are stung by a wasp, you're always being stung by the female because it's her modified egg-laying ovipositor that can also inject venom, which is why it stings. Ignumen wasps are the most ancient of our wasps and they had not yet evolved to have their ovipositor also be a stinger. So ignumen wasps, ancient, around long, long, long before dinosaurs, they cannot sting. They have an ovipositor that just does its original task, which is laying eggs. And the amazing thing about these, as you can see from the giant ignumen photo and the little red one down the left-hand corner, this is what's crazy. 
They use their feet and their antenna to sense, I believe it's through vibrations, beetle grubs moving in the tree, three, four, five inches into the tree. They then take their, their ovipositor, which for many of them, it's three different pieces, like a Swiss army knife, and they use it to drill straight through solid wood and inject their egg into the beetle larva, might be the metallic wood boring beetle larva, in the tree. We believe they do this by sort of finding the little spaces. But here's this thing, it doesn't sting us, but it can stick its ovipositor into the wood of a tree and it injects its eggs into the beetle larva. Those eggs then live inside the beetle larva and eat it inside out like the movie Alien, if you've ever seen that. The people that wrote the movie Alien got the idea from learning about wasps like this. So they're sort of beautiful and horrific at the same time. You might also see a crane fly, which I have here. Crane fly is a type of true fly. They have four, they, I'm sorry, have two wings. True flies like crane flies only have two wings. Wasps all have four wings. Also true flies have tiny antenna you can barely see. Look at these ignumen wasps, they all have long antenna like the length of their body. So it's one way to tell flies apart from wasps, but having to count their wings. Do they have long antenna or basically non-existent antenna? Okay, now I'm calling these delicate veined flyers because that's kind of what they look like. These are also what I was calling aquatic flyers. These are insects that all have larval stages underwater, kind of like a frog in a tadpole. And these are also species that have delicate veined wings. So it's kind of one way to, to tell them apart. So there's mayflies with their wings held up, folded over their body and three tails. There's lace wings with the wings folded lower, closer to the body, and they're kind of rounded and they have sort of funny looking fuzzy heads. There's green and brown. Then there's caddisflies, which also are folded close to their bodies, but a little more angular, less rounded than the lace wings. And their antennae are different, their head's different. These are all things you see near streams. So we don't see a lot of these at Galbraith, but we saw tons of these at Fairfield Osborne because we set up night lights close to the streams. And we'll look at the night lights again in a minute. So just some more delicate winged flyers. Some of these are just weird and crazy. Owl flies, look at those bizarre animals with the ball at the end of their antenna. Dobson flies, size of your hand, whether it's a male or female. Stone flies, wings flat, laid flat and rounded over their body. Fish fly, wings more pointed, long antenna. When you're out enough at night with a, a night light next to a stream, you can get so you can tell these apart in a second. Right away, you see a Dobson fly, you know what it is. You see an owl fly, you know what it is. You just get familiar with them, just like bird watching. Again, these are all gonna be near a stream or a river. Okay, so I think we, let, let's take a couple questions now. Um, Margo, I'm gonna let you pick some questions um, to ask. We'll just do a couple and then we'll, we'll do most of them at the end. Uh, Margo, you're muted. Yep, I got that. <laughs> That should, should be okay, right? Yeah, I hear you, yep. The first question is, is there a beetle in the Eastern Sierra Nevadas that when it flies, it produces a clapping sort of sound? So yes, I would say that it's probably a very large longhorned beetle or a very large scarab. I think they're the only ones big enough to do that. And my guess is you're probably seeing one of the really giant pine sawyers. There are longhorn beetles that are almost the length of your palm and the width of your thumb. And their, their wings, you know, beetles have four wings. They have the heavy leathery elytra on the top. And then this, the larger wings underneath that are more like flies wings, transparent with veins. Those are the ones that do the flying. The heavy elytra just open up and stay still. 
and then the lighter, longer wings do the flapping, but you may be hearing those heavy elytra knocking against each other when that big beetle's flying through the air. So that would be my guess, is that um, it's a very large longhorned beetle, probably. Okay, and then the second question is, could you comment on pine bark beetles, which killed my big Monterey pine in 2020? The yes, yes. Questioner asks. It's been a little while since I've been in California, so I'm not as up to this as I should be, but here, here's my understanding. The worst beetle issues with trees, both on the East and West Coast, are invasive exotic beetles that have been brought over here on boats, they've been brought over here on lumber, and because they're an invasive exotic, there's nothing here to control them and their populations go nuts. However, there are native bark beetles that are also killing trees because of climate change. It's getting warmer enough in Northern California now. So our good old native bark beetles, which for millions of years were not an issue, our native bark beetles, their populations are exploding because of climate change. It's too warm for too long. The winters aren't long enough. The temperature's not getting low enough. And so these beetles are um, having, you know, they're reproducing earlier in the season. They're living longer in the season. They're having more babies. Less of them are being killed off in the winter. Populations are exploding. So they are causing some damage, even though they're native. And then also fires. Fires, even if it doesn't kill a tree, it can weaken it enough so that even a native beetle can kill it. And we're having such issues with fires now that more trees are weakened in our forests than usual. So even a native beetle is killing them. So when a native beetle is killing large amounts of trees, it's because something's out of whack and it's climate change and too many fires. Uh, two other questions. One, sure. uh, can you tell an exact temperature through the sound of the katydids or crickets? Right, that's a really good guess. I, I'm sorry, really good question. Um, so it's um, field crickets and tree crickets that you can do that with. And I'm gonna send all of you via Margot an exact description of how you do it. Um, I'm not gonna close that on the screen here because I don't wanna cause a technical issue. But what you do is you, depending whether it's a field cricket or a tree cricket, you listen for how many chirps there are in a period of about 15 seconds. And then you add, depending on whether it's a tree cricket or a field cricket, you add about 20 to that number. Okay, how many chirps per 15 seconds? And then you add approximately 20 to that number of chirps in 15 seconds. That gives you temperature in Fahrenheit. Wow. I, I will send you all that so you'll know exactly, but I, I gave, that's approximately how it works. Okay, let's do one more question and then we'll move forward. Okay, one more question. What are non-stinging insects called? Right, yeah. So the what we were talking about specifically were ichneumon wasps, ich, ichneumon. Um, and ichneumon, some of you probably know this better than me, but ichneumon, I believe in Latin means non-stinging or no stinging or doesn't sting. So ichneumons are a type of wasp that doesn't sting. Could you put that word in the chat, Kevin, for people? I don't want to try to spell it. <laughs> sure, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to just because I'm afraid <laughs> if I do something more. Okay. Well, but yeah, I, I, believe, get it. I think I, I believe it's I C H. And it, yeah, I C H N E M O U M. Ichneumon. I C H N E M O U M. Ichneumon. Well, it's an N at the end. It's an N at the very end. Oh, all right. You know what? You know what I can do without risking any. Here we go. There it is. So I was wrong. Spelling was never my strong point. Ichneumon wash. There it is. Ichneumon. And I, I bet some of you have learned Latin and can maybe put in the chat the direct translation. Ick Newman. My dad learned Latin. So every time he taught me an insect name, he would tell me what it meant in Latin. And I remembered like 3% of the time. Okay. So we're going to jump in now to, we're going to sort of get away from the specific species and talk about larger questions. Are insects important? Well, yes, of course, very much so. They play a really important balancing role in the ecosystem. They're 
incredibly important food source. There are so many things that eat insects. Bats eat insects, birds eat insects, lizards, salamanders, toads, snakes, turtles, all sorts of mammals. Everything basically eats insects. So they're an incredibly important food source. They're also on the flip side, essential predators, right? Ground beetles like the one here is eating a caterpillar. So they're eating millions of caterpillars, which would then be eating leaves. So they're important predators, plus the ichneumon wasps that are parasitizing bark beetles and wood boring beetles. If not for ichneumon wasps, we'd probably literally have no forests or much smaller forests. Ichneumon wasps are killing millions of beetle grubs that would be eating the trees. So they're essential predators. Pollination. There are many flowers that only bloom at night and are pollinated by moths. There are also some beetles that come out at night that are pollinators, believe it or not. There are some night flying flies that are pollinators. Seed dispersal. If any of you like ginger, violets, trillium, or bloodroot, then you have to also like ants. Ants disperse the seeds, mostly at night, of ginger, violets, trillium, or bloodroot. You would not have those flowers or those spices with ginger without ants dispersing the seeds at night. They completely depend on them. So very important. The most important thing here is soil health, or at least it's certainly one of the most important. If you have ever been walking through the forest, especially maybe summer or fall, and it sounds like it's raining, but it's a sunny day, that's millions of bits of caterpillar poop falling on you through the, the trees. Caterpillar poop is called frass because it sounds better basically. And scientists wanted to call it something else. So it's called frass. And you can often hear frass raining in the woods on a sunny day. It's millions of little bits of caterpillar droppings falling. It is probably the most abundant, accessible source of nitrogen organic fertilizer falling, being added to the forest every year. Tons, trillions of tons of caterpillar droppings around the world, helping our forest grow. And then of course, dung beetles, scarab beetles, taking dung or taking rotting animals and breaking it down so it can be soil. So essential roles in the ecosystem. Kevin, our class is over in about six minutes. Awesome. Or not awesome, but I hear you. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah, I'll be able to move through some of this pretty quickly. Um, so how about us? What role do they play with us? Well, everything I just said was important to us too. Also huge role in agriculture. And you can sort of see that here. They're eating pests that would eat our crops. Insects pollinate chocolate, vanilla, and coffee. You wouldn't have those three things without little midges and gnats pollinating them. So they're very important for agriculture. And just again, this tremendous biodiversity in California is supported in part by all these insects that helps make California's ecosystem so resilient and biodiverse. How do you attract these guys? Well, you can set out lights and we're gonna talk about three different levels. You can have the ground lights. This is the Burley's funnel. You just take leaves and soil, you put it in this contraption, you shine a light, the insects fall down out of it. And then you look at the insects that fall in the little white paper towel. There's complicated, they're simple, but you can see this, it's pretty straightforward and you can see what drops out. These are the insects that live down on the ground. You can also put a board, a rock, a brick, a pipe, a little pot, and then check it once a week. Put these up at different places throughout a woods, meadow, along a stream, see what insects come to different boards, rocks, logs. Burlap strips, pretty straightforward. You wrap that around a tree, you see who comes underneath it. Earwigs, caterpillars, moth bait. You take rotten fruit, rotten beer and rum, brown sugar, molasses, mix it together, let it sit for like a week so it's fermenting and bubbling and nasty. And you paint it on tree, tr tree trunks. You make a trail through a forest, through a meadow, along a stream, different habitats. And then you check it each night and you see what insects come to that bait. You can set up lights, something as simple as stuff you can get for 30 bucks at a hardware store, or you can order from a company called BioQuip, a little more expensive. It's a bright light in a white sheet. That's all it is. Night insects come to these. Bright light in a white sheet or a white bucket. 
you want to spend more money from BioQuip, you get the mercury vapor, which is incredible. Five to six times more insects than the other ones. It's expensive and these are quite hot. <laughs> so you need to be careful. There is sort of a, a safety risk because they're so hot, um, but much simpler are the, the black light. And again, it's a light, it's a sheet, and you hang out at night and see what comes. This is so fun. You can do it as, with a family, little kids. It's an, in, it's an intensive scientific exercise. PhDs around the world use these methods to do important scientific discovery in rainforests, deserts, northern forests. Um, so this can be fun or it can be an intensive study. In, set, in Northern California, September, October is the best time, maybe starting in August, September, October is best. And it's best after midnight. So grab some coffee, turn on some music with your friends, head out there and have fun and, and spend the night. You can photograph them, you can record them, you can put all of it on iNaturalist. So you're sharing your study. You can catch them with nets or a beading sheet where you just shake a branch over this framed sheet, photograph it, share it on iNaturalist. These are three citizen science um, platforms where you can share all of this information and we'll send all of this to you. Historic insect collections can be very helpful. There's one at Fairfield Osborne. You can use this to look at what was there 20 years ago, 10 years ago. If you put the date on the tag, date and location on the tag, then it's useful. And I just have like three slides left. Before our class leaves, one, there is there is one from the, from the class, of, which is if they are on the bait at night and you come with a light, Will you scare them off or, or do they not startle? They really don't startle at night uh, because they're so attracted to that bait. It's, you know, it's like <laughs> they're, they're like addicted to that bait. They're really excited. So plus you can put a little red cellophane over your flashlight or you can use black light. But my experience is the light does not scare them off. The bait makes them drunk basically. And the bright light also almost makes them drunk and delirious. So they're so focused on that, you're not gonna scare them off. These websites and this book are the best for this. We'll send all this to you. Good resources, you can learn all this yourself. You can be engaged in citizen science. Conservation of them is pretty straightforward. Try not to use pesticides. Have more native plants instead of a lawn. Provide shelter like bee boxes, moth gardens, rock shelters. Give them flowers and plants and structure rather than just a lawn. 85% of all insects in your yard are beneficial. People freak out when the insects and, and try to kill them. Tell them at least 85% are beneficial in your gardens. They're helping you. And this is the last thing. Insect gardening is so important. Everything eat insects, you want to bring and this is the last slide, you wanna bring insects to your yard. There's some wonderful insect gardening tips, which these resources that we'll send you, and then that's gonna attract birds and bats and salamanders to eat them. Okay, questions? Well, there aren't many questions. We do have a, a comment. Nathan says, unfortunately, BioQuip is now out of business. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So we have to look elsewhere if people are interested in finding those supplies. Um, I know that Ward's um, biological supplies ex existed years ago. You could try that. Ward's biological supplies. You could try Acorn Naturalist. Acorn Naturalist. You could also just do good old internet search. Yeah. Black lights for night insects. I'm sure you'll find something. Uh, another question are there insects who feed on other insects? Yes, yes. Um, so ground beetles and tiger beetles eat many other types of insects. Um, ichneumon wasps are, excuse me, parasitizing beetle larvae. Um, there are flies that are predatory. There are some crickets and katydids that eat other insects. Um, Lots of beetles, like I said. A lot of the um, caddisflies and mayflies, dobson flies, those delicate winged flyers at night, their larval stage underwater is eating underwater insects. So there are many, many insects that eat other insects. Uh, question from Catherine, what are some safe pesticides? Are there any? 
Sure. So I would say, you know, that that's a pretty involved question, but I would say in general, you want to try to have a yard with a balanced diversity of habitats and native plants, and it will balance itself out. You shouldn't need too many pesticides if you have enough natural predators like birds and bats and insect predators. And you can do that by having a balanced landscape with native plants that will attract the predators that reduce the press. The pests. If you do want to use pesticides, I would suggest using horticultural soaps and horticultural oils. Most chemical pesticides are just not good. Um, there are some naturally occurring bacterias that are used to kill mosquitoes. You can get something called Bt, Bt in pellet form, possibly in spray form, but I think it's pellet form and and like dust form. That's a naturally occurring bacteria that only kills mosquito larvae. But in general, horticultural soaps and horticultural oils are usually less toxic than actual like chemical pesticides. Uh, another question. And I'll, just, I'll just say one last thing. Sure. Make sure you're killing an insect that needs to be killed. <laughs> you know, what a lot of people do is they see insects in their yard and then they go to the hardware store and get pesticides. You should be using something that's targeting a specific pest that really needs to be killed. Just because you have insects in your yard doesn't mean you need pesticides. 85% of them are positive. So if there's a specific pest, find a specific soap or oil that just targets that one pest rather than a broad spectrum that kills everything. Uh, question, do you need a collecting permit for insects? That's going to be different you know, county to county and state to state. But I, my understanding is most of the time you do not, but you need to check. You definitely need to check because it's going to depend on the property owner. You know, for instance, if it's an SSU property like Galbraith or Osborne, then yes, you definitely would need to talk with Margot or Carrie and, and get a collecting permit. Um, it depends on the property. I know here in Virginia, for example, you can collect dragonflies without a permit, because I used to do that. At one point you needed one and then you didn't. So you need to check with the property owner, whether it's private, county, state, and it's it's going to um, differ depending on the property owner. And some in, there are some endangered insect species too. So it may depend on the species. Um, a comment that one of our participants make is, I think Cianocus houses beneficial insects that eat bad ones. Yes, and Ceonothus is a type of native native shrub, I believe, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, I would say I don't know specifically about Ceonothus, but I would say that the vast majority, it's probably safe to say all, but you never want to say all because then, you know, it's 99.9%, .9%, but the vast majority of native plants are going to support an insect species that is in some way positive. Either it's a predator or um, it's beneficial because it's a pollinator or it's beneficial because of seed dispersal or it's beneficial purely because that particular plant produces, helps supports a lot of insects that are eaten by maybe an endangered bat. So the vast majority of native plants are going to support some sort of insect that is beneficial in some way, yes. Does anyone else have any other questions? We don't have any in the chat or a comment from uh, saying there is a huge problem in several countries where farmers use lots of pesticides, which has consistently resulted in increases, actually results in increase of pesticides because the predators, the beneficial predators end up dying out and they can't control the original pests. Yes, I, I'm, and there's been issues all over, including right here in America. I know at one point there was a real serious issue with pesticides in China having to do with pollinators of fruit trees, but it's really every country, including there's been huge problems here in America. So unfortunately, no one is exempt from making this mistake. Right. Um, and yes, the kind of the biggest message, again, is that 85%, at least 85% of insects in your yard or anyone in your neighborhood are beneficial. So when you use a broad spectrum pesticide or simply incorrectly or carelessly apply even a specific pesticide, it's likely to kill as many, if not more, of the beneficial predator insects. 
You're going to kill the robber flies and the dragon flies and the assassin bugs and the tiger beetles and the ichneumon wasps, and you're going to kill the pollinators. So in general, if you're using pesticides, you want to make it very specific to a specific pest. Um, and even then be very, very careful. It's, it's best to avoid them whenever possible because they have all sorts of collateral damage. One other comment from Edith who says that calscape.org, C-A-L-S-C-A-P-E.org lists some insects that are hosted by native plants in California. Wonderful. I'm not familiar with that website, so that's good to know. That sounds great. And we could be sure to share that with everyone. And yeah. in general, a great way to learn about native insects is native plant societies. Every state in the country, all 50, have a native plant society, and many of them have a county-specific native plant society. California has one of the best native plant society chapters in the country. And almost all of those native plant societies that I have visited their websites, they specifically talk about beneficial insects. They understand the relationship between native plants and native insects. So native plant societies, which exist in every state, will give you all sorts of information about beneficial insects for your garden, um, pollinators. And again, I, I just want to repeat again that, you know, the vast majority of insects are beneficial. So it's not like there's a small group of beneficial insects. At least 85% of all insects are beneficial. And even the ones that aren't, quote, beneficial are food for somebody, right? They're food for warblers, tanagers, vireos. They're food for bats and lizards and snakes. Um, so it's sort of stepping back and, and maybe rephrasing the issue. You know, insects in general are important and beneficial, and there are only a very few of them that are pests, rather than looking at it the other way. Okay. Well, I think that's it on the, the questions, Kevin. If anybody else has something else, we'll just uh, wrap this up, I think. And thank you so much, Kevin. I've got lots of notes of, of thank you and appreciation in the chat for your presentation. And I uh, really appreciate that. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is just one of the events that, that CEI at SSU is presenting. Our next one, we have one in Spanish, Descubre el Bosque. And we have on uh, at the Galbraith Preserve on December 3rd. And we have one on December 4th at the Osborne Preserve, which is Photography for All Abilities, which is an accessible educational outing for people with mobility needs and their caretakers with, at all levels of photo photographic skills. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you all for joining us. And we hope to see you at another one of our Dig Into Nature programs. Take care. Thanks.